<laughs> All right. Uh, welcome back to Let's Talk About It, a leadership development podcast brought to you by the Lesniak Institute for American Leadership. We are a local nonprofit located in Union, New Jersey on King University's campus. And we're your hosts. My name is Felipe. And Claudia. And today we have a very special guest. He was a previous intern at the Lesniak Institute over the fall. And he is currently a student studying environmental science at King University. Mr. Derek Galli Martinez. How are you? Hey, Derek, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Thanks for stopping by. Always a pleasure. You look, you look really nice in your suit. Thank you. What, what, what's your pin there? Well, this pin, honestly, um, when I was buying my suit, it just called to me. It, I'm a big supporter of the art. I love arts. You know, when it comes to theater, whether it's abstract or conventional, I think that we shy away from supporting arts. So I always wear this pin to let people know. Mm. That is a nice pin. That's cute. Yeah, I've never seen a pin like that. That's why I asked. That's oh, it's it's um a painting thing. It's like mm -hmm. oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> look, wow, look <laughs> at that. So Derek, um, you know it, we've had you here as an intern over the fall, and you recently won the inaugural award of an internship excellence award at King University. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about your internship, and then we will go about. Um, talking about why internships are important, but can you start first with telling us about your personal experience being an intern at the Lesniak Institute? Yes, well, I'm going to be honest. Uh, the first time that I came to the office, I was a little shy. I was like, oh, who are these people? And then I met Claudia. Claudia always greets everyone with a smile, which is great. Um, but my favorite part of interning here was Operation Santa. Mm. Um, you know, getting to work, um, you know, weeks before, is sending out the calls, making the calls, writing the scripts, um, shooting the little videos, and actually the day of was, I think, one of the most significant days I had so far, um, because seeing the smiles on, on the children's face was worth everything. Mm. I remember that day. Um, you were helping out a lot, and I remember that same day, your leg was hurting or your your knee was hurting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was one leg down. <laughs> waddling around. I felt so yeah, bad. He was trying his best <laughs> the whole time, though. Like, <laughs> you, you really, like, I'm... I'm Powered I'm, through. Yeah. Yeah, af after that, I went to the hospital. <laughs> I know. But, um, you know, I always believe that if I commit to something, um, whether I'm in pain or not, show up. Yeah. Because you made that commitment. Right. It's and personal philosophy. And your help, honestly, we had the most successful Operation Santa in Lesniak Institute history. So your, your, with your help and the rest of your intern class, we were able to make a very successful, and I think more importantly, an impactful event. Yeah, yeah so um, talking about you know the, the Institute, and uh, I know you said that Operation Santa really touched your heart. Which one of our causes really presented with you? Um, that we advocate for? Environmental justice. Mm. Um, because environmental justice is, is often mistaken that it's just about the environment. It's also about people. Um, because as we know, yes, our end goal is to help and stop climate change, but we can't do that without addressing the cause root, systemic racism. Color communities around mm -hmm. the nation are disproportionately affected by environmental issues, mm -hmm. such as air quality, uh, water quality, and other hazards. Um, why does this matter? Because you cannot expect someone to be a citizen of the world, which is something that we strive for, to be a citizen of the world, not just this nation, if their basic needs are not met, if they don't have clean water to drink, if they can't breathe air, and in New York, there's an alley called the asthma alley. You know why? Because the air quality is so bad, everyone who lives there has asthma. Hmm. And most people who live there are people of color, mostly African-American and Latinx. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And what got you into environmental protection? Because you're studying environmental science now at Kane. So is this something, since you were little, is this something you, you learned? Well, I, c I come from a farming background. 
So mm-hmm. you're a farmer. Um, I'm a farmer by trade. Um, and losing the farm to big corporations ignited the fight. Mm. Um, and then coming over to the U.S. and seeing um, just the difference from living in Puerto Rico in the Lion Land, seeing the environment there, and then coming here, and seeing that you know everyone is clutter. Um, there's not much space for nature and humans to coexist. And you know that that helps. We get, we can get into urban planning and how we can fix that. But what really brought me was people need help and academia and policy has to come together with grassroots organizing in order to find an effective solution. Mm-hmm. So that's what got me in. Why? Because I started grassroots, I'm in academia, and I organize. So what I try to do for myself is teach about these subjects to my fellow peers and to um, younger generation, like this Saturday, I'll be teaching the Girl Scouts um, about these key issues. Because, and I, I believe in this wholeheartedly, the children are the future. So we have to make sure we teach the next generation. Mm-hmm. And you, you, how old are you again? Sorry? Oh, I'm 20. You're yeah. 20, right? So you still kind of are part of that generation as well. Yes. So it's glad I'm glad to see that you're making a difference and um, you're really fighting for our future and the planet's future. Mm-hmm. So you are an environmental science major at Kane, but you talked a little bit about policy change and a lot about academia. Where are your future goals with all of that? Well, my future goals are simple. Um, to bridge the bridge between policy, community, and academia. Um, which I like to refer to the triactic, right? Because you cannot target one without the other. Um, often policies are made by a legislator without actually thinking about the community. Sometimes we like to think what our community needs instead of asking. So by doing this approach of not only connecting with the grassroots people in those communities, but by also bringing the research and the scientific aspect of things, is that we can make holistic policies. Um, For example, um, just um, three Saturdays ago, I attended the Food and Water Watch uh, first New Jersey uh, climate action gathering. Mm. Um, there you had people from the community, you had people from academia, and you had people from policy. And why is that important? Because you have to understand, you need the people's backing in order to make effective change. Mm. So for somebody of your age and you know, being a student, you're very involved in what you believe needs to be changed, right? You advocate for what you think needs to be changed. Um, What advice can you give to students like you who are passionate or are finding what they're passionate about? How can they get involved and make different, like make a true change and make a difference? Don't do it alone. Mm. It takes a village, it takes an army. I surround myself with a group of people who, three important things are reliable, are hardworking, and they fight the good fight. Why? Because, and all three has to be true at the same time. Or if not, your circle will not work. Why? I start with a good fight first. The reason why they have to fight a good fight and be willing to is because the fight is not easy. There'll be curves, there'll be people trying to silence you, so you have to make sure they are for the fight. Then they have to be reliable. They have to be consistent. This work gets tiring, and I'm not, I'm not here to lie to you, especially if you're my age. Mm-hmm. It gets tiring sometimes to see because there's so much things we need to do, and it feels like we don't have a lot of time to do. And hardworking, because, like I said before, sometimes you would be hurt. Sometimes you can't, you have that thing that you can't get up but because of your personal ethics and your drive, you'll continue to go on. There's some times that I don't want to be doing this fight, but if I continue with the mindset, 
somewhere else takes care of it, it never gets done. Mm. So you believe that first, just kind of recapping mm-hmm. what you just said, you said that um, in order to make true change and in order for an, in- for an individual to start in their path of advocacy, they need to first find their people who will advocate for the same thing or have the same mentality as them? Yes, and here's why. Because, yes, traditionally people think of the advocate as a, you know, a singular person, mm-hmm. but the rules have changed. The rules of engagement of advocacy has changed. Now you have censoring. Um, just, you know, I'm sad to bring this up, but just um, let's look at the issue of a Congo, right? You have people who are actively, especially online, and my generation uses the online platform the most, they would s- continuously silence certain issues. So now it's not about you being a single union network. Because why? If they shut you down, they can't shut down everybody. Mm. And the more people you have, the, mo- the bigger your network, the bigger your network, the greater the chance you're going to get something done. Mm. Mm-hmm. Sadly, we're in a stage that is no longer visible to be an advocate by yourself. You must have a team. You must have a community. Yeah, you need to start a movement, yep. basically. And how do you recommend people find like others like them? Like, I know it's hard if you're really passionate about one issue. Where do you personally like go to look? Or how do you find people with like mindsets? Great question. You don't. Here's why. You get to know people first. You, you never go at them with the issue first. You get to know them at a personal level. Believe it or not, people will find you. That's what happened to me here at King University. I was doing my research, and then people found me. Why? Because no matter if you're in a university, if you're in the workforce, and, and if you're doing trade school, or anything else that you're engaged in, people will always find you because of who you are. Right, for me, again, for me here at Kane, it was attending clubs, uh, just hanging out outside. People overheard conversations. They wanted to join the conversation. Let them join. There's a beautiful thing about organic organizing. Sometimes you don't have to go and people say, hey, do you care about this? Do you want to join? No, organic organizing is so important and it's so often overlooked. Like, for example, how I met you guys at the tabling. I really didn't know much about, but I heard over her you speaking to another student. I said, like, okay, Linsniak Institute, let me look into them. So what I did, I took a minute or two, I searched you up, I searched your mission, and then I came back and talked to the table. Just things like that. Sometimes the best thing to do is to just listen. That's how you find people. That's really good advice because a lot of people nowadays like to talk without listening, but a huge part about learning and growing is just sitting back and like silently listening. So, no, going back to what you said, I think that's so powerful. And, you know, um, besides like you you did like a quick Google search in the Lesnia Institute, you came up to us, you knew our mission, our causes, you know, that's always helpful. Mm-hmm. But you took action, though. You saw us at the table and... You heard a conversation, and you were like, oh, I'm, I really like, I'm interested in what they're doing. I want to learn more. But most students, I feel like they're in that specific situation. They just kind of go, okay, I'll get back to it, or they'll be there when I walk back. But you decided to take action. You approached our table, which, like, takes a lot of courage, you know, like, introducing. I know you have, like, that already. Like, that doesn't really matter to you, but for a lot of students, that's really hard to like go up to a table and talk to people. So I think what you explained is perfect because, you know, you need to take action in those specific situations. And it ended up working out because, you know, you ended up being an intern here um, and you're still doing a lot of great stuff around campus as well. I know you recently reinstated the community garden. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, to be honest, that was not the original plan. The original plan was to reopen the cane farm. But with anything I do, you know, you need data. I'm a big data person as a researcher here at Kane. 
So we opened the community garden May 15th. Um, it was going to be open to campus wide through the summer. We will be there. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of people love the idea of growing their own food in their backyard, but not every community has a community garden. Mm. The beauty about Kane University, especially here at the uni campus, is that we are majority commuter school. So while many people would see that as a disadvantage, I see it as an advantage because what we teach here, people can take back to their community. It, it, it all ties in. If you want change, you can start one place, but because you know those people will go home and then think about, okay, let me start my own garden in my backyard. Yeah. It's all about planting the seed. Most things that make change, it starts with a little seed just like gardening, and you water it, and then change will continue. So the reason for the community garden is three main goals. Teach people how to grow their own food. Have a green space on campus, and also, because we deserve more fresh fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you know what's interesting? Well, first, before I get into that, um, do you have a garden? You do, right? Yeah, I have a garden at my house. I want to learn how to, like, like grow my own vegetables and stuff like that. So I'm definitely going to go to the community garden and see what I can learn to, like, start my own little garden or whatever. Yeah, I think it's important also because we're in an urban environment up here, like, at my house, I have like a really big backyard and I have the space to like literally grow vegetables in my own area, but not everybody has that, especially in an urban, you know, city like state. Um, so it's really cool that you get to teach a lot of the people here uh, how to grow their own food. <laughs> so the community garden is starting again. There yeah. was one before. There's, w I believe, like two to three years ago, there were one. And what happened to that um, garden, and how is it going to be different this time where it continues and doesn't go away? Well, to speak with my background, I set up three different community gardens. So <laughs> This is your first one at Kane, though. This is my first okay. one at Kane. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference is we have partners this time. Mm -hmm. um, the garden community garden was handled by the gardening club before. This time it's going to be handled by an alliance of the Lesniak Institute, mm -hmm. my uh, organization, the United Nations Association, and the Environmental Alliance. Why, people ask why so many alliances. The reason is, just in case one falls, the other two can pick up. Um, also, we had donations from uh, Grand Work Elizabeth, yep. um, the College of Dorothy Hand in Science and Mathematics donated some, and because, not to be that person, but because we're gonna have a great team. Mm. Um, the beautiful thing that this project is student-led. So not only student-led, but students who are passionate about this subject. Mm -hmm. um, me and Beatrice, who's also the other person who's been really working at this, um, we're both environment science students. And you know, as you know, the environment science department here at Kane is very small. So all the environmental science students kind of know each other. Um, and I'm proud to say we have over 25 people signed up already, and the number keeps growing. So there's a genuine interest here at Kane for They're it. They're all students as well. These are all students, and we're also going to um, partner with EOF, Supera, and these other um, programs. That way the, su the students who are coming in the summer can also have a chance to join. Mm -hmm. And those students will be officially enrolling Kane in fall. So you talk about partnerships that um, started and that you're c like looking into for the community garden. Um, so when the community garden at Kane was an idea to get this started again, I remember you talked about it before, but you really like took full control and like really tried towards, I think the beginning of this year, or was it last year or towards the end of last year? The beginning of my freshman years when I started this. Okay. Took a, it took a while. Yeah. Too. So would you say you were the main person trying to advocate for this community garden to be started again? I would say so, yes. Yeah. Um, and wh wh what made you, like, continue? Because I just want to say, like, I know sometimes, especially in a university setting, it's hard to get ideas from the, the drawing board to actually, you know, now you guys are, like, 
about to start it for real. So what made you stay so persistent and why didn't you give up? Need. Mm. And that's a great answer, actually. And how did you find these partners? Like EOF, Supera, like where, where did you go? Well, I'm, I'm a part of EOF as well. I'm a proud EOF student. Um, and just knowing people around campus, um, I think that my biggest asset in campus and outside of campus is that I try to be helpful. And people notice when you're helpful. So how this thing is, I went to the offices, I wrote them emails, and I said, hey, um, we'll be starting the community garden this summer. We'd love just your students to join, and we'll be able to give community service hours. Mm -hmm. um, and to actually answer more than just need, really want. Need and want are my two biggest driving force. The need for the teaching to happen and the want to teach. That's my, my two main things. And why? Because, if I, again, let's go back to the mindset. As in a lot of universities, a lot of people are like, okay, somebody else will pick it up. Somebody else will do it. But the sad reality is if you don't do it, no one else is going to do it. Mm -hmm. So keeping that in mind, I was like, okay, if I give up halfway through this project, nothing's going to happen. happen. Yeah. So you use your network? I did. I and networking is important. Networking is important. Important. And because of my network and because of having contacts and groundwork, Elizabeth, um, have obviously having contact with you guys, being a member of the Environmental Alliance, being the regional president and co-founder of the UNA, mm -hmm. I am able to really piece everything that I have and make sure it works together. Um, not only for this project, but for up and coming projects as well. So um, we, I was there when you won the inaugural um, Internship Excellence Award. Um, can you, before we wrap up here, I know we have a few minutes left. Um, can you tell the people listening why it's important to network and why internships are essential for career development? Yes. Um, network is important and not just because of your immediate gain from networking, but your future gain, right? So throughout my life, obviously I didn't start a great networker. I had to work at it. Um, I learned that if, you're, if you don't take the action and you don't take the responsibility to network for yourself, to advocate for yourself, your network will keep small and you won't be able to get places. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know, yeah. right? That's why network is important. Because right now, I'm a cane. But who knows about 20 years, my network, they could be somewhere else, and I'll be trying to get a job at that point. So guess what? I can shoot a text, or I can shoot an email to my network. Like, hey, I heard that you guys are hiring. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my resume. Can you make sure the HR department gets it? Yep. And internships are so important because they give you that experience to get to a place where you can be that network for someone else. I'm interning here has taught me that, okay, um, policy looks different for everyone, right? The way I think of policy may not be the way you think of policy. The way I think about politics may not be your way of thinking. But the ability that we have to work together, which is a very good lesson to have, and that's some, not the only thing, but one of the main things that internship gets you. It gets you working with other people with different values, with different ideas, but still being able to manage to accomplish something. Yeah. I also feel like internships are important because nowadays, especially with people who just graduated from college, a lot of the times employers want like three experience. or four years in experience when you just graduated college. Like, how is that possible? So internships are a really good way to kind of not fully like not fully make that OK, but kind of like give them a better idea. Do you have any other questions for Derek? Um, no, I think I think you spoke beautifully, Derek. Uh, would you like to plug anything or um, any organizations yeah. that you're a part of, even if it's the community garden? Definitely. Um, so first, um, my people in District Six. Um, I'm currently working on uh, John Shoe's campaign. He's running for Congress, uh, he's a, someone who I believe in and has done great work in the community. 
He's a labor organizer. Um, he has stood with the union. So that's something, one of the big things that I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the United Nations Association, the Akin University. Uh, we do have chapters online, so you can join even if you're not at Kane. Um, you know, we teach about human rights. We teach about all different topics. We cover the entire 17 goals of sustainability and development of the United Nations. And obviously, make sure you apply for the Institute. They're looking for summer interns. Yes, they are. So. And make sure you do your part to clean the environment. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, Derek. Mr. Derek Galli Martinez, thank you so much for stopping by thank our you. office and being part of this podcast episode. Um, and we're really so excited to see where your future takes you. And you're always welcome here anytime. Of course. Thank you very much. All right. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Um, we will see you guys in the next episode. I don't like smoke.